The B-Sides Nova 2019 presentation will begin momentarily. 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 The B-Sides Nova 2019 presentation will be... Thank you. Tell me... Four, five, I can... Good. All right. Day-to-day -day basis. Virtual machines today. Have the best life ever. All right. So, who am I? Um, Brandon Mitchell. I'm with a small company called Boxboat. We are a... Docker solutions provider, everything around containers, all the good stuff. But they're not paying me to be here, so I, I won't talk too much about them. Part of the Docker captain's programs, their little evangelist goes around talking about Docker, telling you all the good stuff about Docker. I'll, I'll kind of fill that role today. And then Stack Overflow, I've answered way too many questions on there. That's how they actually pulled me in the program. All right, so big question. You're probably not here to hear about who I am. You want to know about Docker and containers and what is a container and all that good stuff. So let's get a quick level set. Um, saw a bunch of people did raise their hand. More people didn't raise their hand. So I want to kind of put this whole level set in there. That a container is, if you think about a virtual machine, it's going to isolate an entire operating system to run that on some shared hardware. A container is going to isolate your application to run that on a shared kernel. So you're isolating just the application, not a full virtual machine. So it's different tier of isolation. And with that different tier of isolation, we can do some different stuff. Some things you can do a virtual machine that you can't do it in a container and vice versa. So from that, um, the implementation of this, mostly on Linux side, is with two tools inside Linux kernel, namespaces and C groups. So the namespaces, you get some um, kind of like for process IDs, for the other things in there. I'm looking at networks, stuff like that. They give you your own little space when you're inside the container where you see only your own processes. You see only networks that are associated to just your one application that's running in there. You don't see everything else. And most importantly, the file system. You're only going to see the file system that you've defined for your container, not the file system for everything else that's on the host. So a lot more isolation there. If any Linux admins in the room think CH, that kind of thing. All right, the other part of this, C groups. Docker doesn't turn them on by default. Um, and I don't think many container systems do because nobody knows how much memory, how much CPU to allocate to your application. That's for you to know. So they put that there as a knob you can turn. Once you figure it out, sort it out how much you want to move. And did I lose it? No, nope. good. Once you figure out how much CPU and memory, um, set that knob, and that's going to help you prevent a denial of service attack. So somebody starts sending a couple of terabytes of network traffic to your website and takes it down, and you can't find. Akamai or somebody to take care of you. This is what's going to limit 
this one container from taking all the other containers down on that same machine. So if somebody sets up the Bitcoin miner, even though it's not profitable anymore, it's going to avoid that one container that's going crazy from taking everybody else down the same host. So that's the two tools you get with containers. That's how they implement this on the back end. All right. Um, make sure I can see my notes here. The minimal file system part is really important, though. Most of the time, we're coming into virtual machines, and we've got a file system with cron, syslog, systemd, all these other tools out there. And when you're doing this with a, um, with a container, all you have is just the stuff that's needed to run your application. You don't need all those other tools out there. You're just running just the environment to run your one application. So it's really important to get a minimal file system in there. And lastly, those last two bullets there, the ephemeral and mutable, I'll talk about that in a second, but keep that in mind. All right. So containers are pretty much, from the security standpoint, bad for security. That's what most uh, security conferences will probably tell you about this. And they're 100% of the right, 100% right about 50% of the time with considering 93% of statistics are made up on the spot. So it is a shared kernel. So if you have a kernel exploit and something finds a way to go into the kernel and breach and get around all those different security settings, they now have full access to the host because you're on a shared kernel. And that means they have full access to all the other containers running there. So it's not as much isolation inside of a container as you would have in a virtual machine. So absolutely, you got, they have a huge point there. Um, it's also seen as an awesome way to run unknown code as a root user on your machine that you downloaded from the internet. That's kind of the running joke with containers. Um, and I see it a lot. I do see a whole bunch of people that just look up some blog post, say this is the way we want to run Java in production, and you'll see a Fortune 500 just download some random person's Java runtime to run their application. And it's scary when you see the people doing that kind of stuff. Um, huge for lateral pivoting. So once you get into one container, it usually has access to all the other containers on that same machine, maybe across multiple machines if you have the overlay network. So really easy access to go from one to the other because you don't see a lot of tooling on the network layer for containers. It's the tooling on the network layer is for the actual host. And so once you get into one container, you usually have carte blanche access to everything on that same environment, all the other containers out there. All right, so lateral pivoting is huge. and Again, what I was saying, the running joke here, running stuff as root that you found on the internet. A lot of containers that come off the, off the various registries out there, a lot of the images you're downloading, they do default to run stuff as root. So pretty much true in a lot of cases. You know, 50% of the cases, 93% of the time. All right. Um, let's see. Last right there. Docker API. That one, a lot of people have issues with it, and for good reason. The Docker API is pretty much full root access on a server. If anyone has access to that, they have full admin access to everything because they can run a container that has all the namespaces and everything turned off as a root user with all the file system for at least see people in the world. You want to keep that to be a user access. There are plenty of vulnerable applications out there. I didn't even try to find one. I just went ahead and wrote one of my own real quick and go. I just made a quick little HTTP server, and all it does is whatever it sees on the script parameter you pass into it just passes it to a shell. Pretty. Uh, Pretty bad thing to run, so obviously I did not put that on the network here. Didn't think people would take too long to find that one. So to exploit that, really simple, you just run a curl command. Run the curl command, pass the script in there, and now you've got whatever command you wanted to run on whatever machine that is. So that's pretty much the definition of remote code execution, right? So real simple, we want to take something like this and just to give you an example, if we were to run this on the host, and hopefully everybody can see it in the back. If I was to run this on the host, here's the full code, nothing up my sleeves, all the same things we saw on the last screen there. If I was to run something like this on the box, you're going to see that we have full access to that system. So the important lines there. So it's just a Go binary, so I'm just going to do a little Go run here, kick that thing off, and I'll fire up another window, and I've got a little exploit script out there. This script is just that curl command, and I'm going to call this a whole bunch of times in these little slides. So when I kick this off, I can see that I can see all the files on that machine. So through the web server, I'm now accessing and able to hit any of those files. And if I go out there and I say run this, um, you know, touch a file or something like that, I'm now going to be modifying files on that remote machine, which in this case is the same local machine, but potentially this could be anywhere on the internet. So we're able to hit that stuff. So given that, we now have an exploit that we can work with that we want to try to lock down. This isn't about how to lock it down because I'm just a terrible Go program writer. This is more about what the containers can do to help us limit some of this stuff. So 
given this scenario, what happens if we place this app inside of a container? What's that going to get us? Well, we saw on the earlier slide the namespaces, the C groups, that kind of stuff, a limited file system. And to put it in a container, you need one simple thing, which is a Docker file in the Docker world. This Docker file is going to take this little, um, think of it as a recipe. It's going to take this recipe and it is going to convert this into a Docker image. That image is kind of the template for now running a container. So that's kind of the logical process we go through. And it's a real simple recipe that you go through. The firm line on the very beginning says this is the image we're going to begin from. Everything in the world of containers, you start with a base image and then you build on top of that. So when you're building your image that you want to create your application in, you start with something. So I start with the Golang image out there. I add in the code in there with the copy command. That's going to add another layer into that whole file system that Docker is building up with all of our pieces. The run command, the go build, is going to generate our application binary. And then the CMD at the end is a bit of metadata. So the images are a bunch of file system layers. And this metadata here is just how to run this image later on. So when we kick this off into a container, that all that metadata is used. And so that just says kick off the program called slash, the dot slash app. So let's see this in practice. Same Docker file we were just looking at a second ago. Nothing up the sleeves there. The same run line we're going to take instead of a go build, we're just going to, or instead of the go run we saw last time, we're going to do a go build. Going to kick this off. And what I use to turn this from a Docker file into an image is a Docker build command. So I just build this. And fortunately, a lot of these things, I have cached all these commands, so these run pretty quickly. Um, but even if they didn't, they aren't too slow to run something like this. Bigger images take a little bit longer, obviously. And then the run command here is going to take that image and turn it into a container. So we've got our whole process here. We take an application and put it into a container. It's up and running now. Now let's see if we can exploit it. Try this, try this attack out. And we kick this off, just a little simple hello world, and we have no network connection in there. So no network connection at all. That, uh, that's not too good for throwing stuff in containers. That's pretty much a failure on containerizing our application, and we need to forget about all this Docker stuff and go home. Or we can change our app real quick. We had namespaces. And loopback inside of a container belongs just to that one container. You can't access loopback from outside. So a lot of people that do local development, they put stuff that listens locally on their one machine. When you put that in a container, you now cannot access that from outside of the container at all. And so the one thing you have to change is just change your listening to say, listen on all interfaces. And in Go, you just take the IP out of there. Other applications, you might do the quad zero, zero dot zero dot zero dot zero. So we put that in there. We change our application so that now we can run this inside of a container. And see the one line I changed there, just took the IP out, address out of there. This is only changing the, the list side of the container, doing a little port mapping from the so whole root, at, root execution attack. So let's see if that one worked. Did it and Hazachi's capabilities away. They restricted the root user so the root user inside the container doesn't have the full access as the root user on the host. It can't do stuff that can get it out of the container. It can't mount file systems. It, in fact, can't even see the devices for the file systems, but if it could, it can't mount the file systems because it doesn't have the mount ability. Can't change the host name, it can't change the date, and the reason you can't change the date is that's not a namespace value. If they let you do that, you'll be changing the date for everybody, so they don't let you do that. So we tweak this stuff where you've got a bunch of capabilities. You can hard now, let's take away the raw network access and the CHRN access, and if you do that, and we try to run those same two commands as before, we're not able to ping, and you'll see we're not, not able to chrn a file either. So even though we're able to touch a file, even though we're still able to run the file, do all that stuff, the chrn, that one's still going to fail. So we've still got stuff that's vulnerable, still exploitable, but we've limited a lot more than what it would be if it was running a regular virtual machine normally. So we're locking this down a little bit. Not completely, but still getting closer. Now, I promised a bit ago on the earlier slide, ephemeral immutable. People hear these terms. They're thrown out all over the place. What on earth do they mean? So immutable refers to the images. That image recipe we built with the Docker file is going to generate an image. It contains various layers. Each one of those lines in the Docker file is kicking off another layer in the file system that it's generating. And those layers cannot be changed once they're created. Docker creates them. They have a checksum in there. If you want to change an image later on, you add more stuff into it, and we started doing those other steps later on in the file, later on in that Docker file, those were adding more layers on. They're not changing the previous layers. You're not modifying the Golang image that comes from Docker. You're just adding on more layers for your own image. So that's what they mean by immutable. 
we go in and we start up a container, you can't change those layers at all. The whole file system from that point up in the image is read-only. What the container does is it puts a little read-write layer on below all of that. And that read-write layer is gonna give your application access to do stuff, but when the container goes away, that read-write layer goes away too. So that's what we mean by the ephemeral part. These containers should be temporary, they shouldn't be long-lasting. So when we take this stuff away, the container goes away, and all of our changes go away. So let's see that one in action a little bit. Kick our same Docker container off that we were doing before, do our same exploit we were doing a second ago, just throwing a little file out on the file system. And just like before, that worked. Just like before, we're able to list the file over there. But this file only exists inside the container. It's not gonna exist on the host. It's not gonna exist on the image. If I list the files on the host, you're gonna see that that doesn't exist out there. So it's isolated just that container. And if I go out and restart that same container we were running from the same image, so it's identical environment, but we just restart it, replace the original container, and I go out and run my same ls command a second time, it's gonna say it's not there. From the attacker standpoint, this means that our attacks can't modify the image, so we can't go out there and completely blow away the whole environment we're attacking. We can't do an rm-rf and have that be persistent because all the stuff is still there in the image as before. It also means that the ephemeral part means that the second someone replaces this container, the second someone upgrades something and, re and does a change in the environment, our attack environment, whatever we've loaded, all of our attack code that we put out there is gone. It's disappeared because the container got replaced and everything we put out there is gone. There is a negative side to that. Had a nice little talk earlier about forensics and when you delete the container and the container is gone, now all your forensics that you can analyze of someone that did do an attack is now gone as well. So pro and a con to this one. But that's what they mean when they're saying that it's ephemeral and immutable. So persistent data is the next question most people have. They wanna know, hey, you know, I don't have an environment that everything is ephemeral. I actually need to keep some data out there. And to do that, that's gonna be what's called using a volume in Docker. That's just mounting a file system from outside of the container into the container. Usually it's from the host. It could be something from NFS, wherever you're pulling your data in from. You just mount that into the container that makes your data persistent now, because now you've mapped, mapped that part of the file system in, so now you have the persistence, but that also gives you another attack vector. Now if someone does an rm-rf on that directory, your data is gone, because that's not managed by Docker, that's not ephemeral, that's not immutable, that's just like any other directory anywhere else. So, pro tip there. So we talked about running stuff as root. We should probably run stuff as a user. Probably shouldn't run everything in the world as root. Um, so the containers, typically though, they're rarely in a multi-user environment. The whole point, I think a lot of times people see multiple applications, it's not a multi-user environment, you know, is there really a need? And I'm gonna say yes there is. First off, inside of the container, if you aren't running as root, you potentially can't modify all the other files in the file system inside the container. So we lock that down. Secondly, if we escape from the container and we're, we get out from the container to the host somehow, you don't want them to escape out onto the host as UID zero, rather than be some random other user. And those Linux file system permissions that we have anywhere else, those are able to work inside the container just like anywhere else, and so we can limit what's going on there. So, the one downside of this is low number of ports. If you have an application like a web server bind to port 443, and you run that in a container, you can't bind to port 443 unless you're root in the container. But you can bind to port 8443 in the container, and you can map the host port 443, so, that mapping can correct that from outside to inside, so you don't have to run your application as root if you don't need to. You can put it in there as the rare user, bind to a high number port, and just use that mapping to correct it. So let's see what happens when we try to run something as a user instead of as the root user. Really not too hard to do. In our Docker run command, I'm just passing an extra flag in here. I didn't modify the image, so we still pull down an image out there that defaults to running everything as root. But that doesn't mean we're running stuff as root on the machine. We just changed the flag when we ran this container. So we kick that off. And we'll see when we run this that the process there when we run the ID command is now we're back up to 1,000. So we're no longer running stuff as root. Huzzah, the world is good. All the files in that file system are still owned by root. So now if we try to make a change into there, if we try to write something into that file system, we're gonna see that we don't have access to modify it. So if we go in and we just try to put a little code in there and we write that into the same directory, permission it died. So there we go, Linux saved the world there, everything is fine, everything is dandy, except there's a temp directory. 
and the temp directory has write access to everybody in the world. We run our exploit over there. We can ls the temp directory and see that our exploit is loaded into theirs, whatever user ID is, and now we can go out and kick that off. So that didn't really save us a whole lot. Saved us a little. They can't go in and modify our application. They can't potentially put something in there that if they, instead of replacing the container, just restart the container, would kick off some code we don't want to be kicked off. But we still have this attack vector where they could just load some code and temp kick it off if they needed to load some kind of payload out there. So let's take away everything. How many people in here running a virtual machine had their virtual machines running with a read-only file system? A temp file system that gets mounted on top of it. So if we were to do that, and I'll probably actually pause this slide because I go a little quick on this one. If we were to do that, the one line in there that we're kicking off, the read-only, I threw in there in addition to that a whole long mount line that just says mount this temporary file system, which is an in-memory file system, comes up as blank to start with, in this one path in the container, and I gave it the same permissions that we had before so that we can, no, no stickers? I'll, I'll give them out anyway. All right, you can also see that I'm blowing out the whole tmux command line buffer there, but if I scroll up or if I go to the top there, you can see that the root file system is mounted read-only. No modifications at all to the root file system in this scenario. But we still have our app run directory. So we still have a vulnerable file system in there that we can attack. But otherwise, the entire application code, everything else, hang a read-write layer where all the modifications normal. So you have directory, it's got read-write. It also has no set UID, no exec, and no devices. So if we try to kick this code off, no exec, you're not gonna be able to execute any binaries out there. So if someone loads a malicious payload into this file system, they're gonna see that they can't run that. We can still see HMOD the file, still has the permission bit set, but if we try to kick it off, permission denied. So now we have a file system out there, the one file system they can write to where they can't run any code in there. Except that code in this case is a shell script. So if you have any interpreters, any JREs to kick off code, any shells at all on the file system, you can still use that shell to read, the, read that code, read that script, and run it. So we haven't permitted all the attacks, but if they throw any binaries out there, run them. So we cut a lot of these options off. So we're getting there. We're starting to lock things down in ways you really can't lock them down normally on a VM because it's not that trivial to do so. So let's keep on going with this. If they can use our shells, if they can use our JREs, if they can use whatever code out there we put out there, uh, you know, a Node.js interpreter, whatever code out there that they're you know, wanting to run, they can use whatever our interpreters are against us. Let's get rid of them all. Let's, let's skip the whole file system. Effectively, an rm-rf, or from the Windows side, a format C colon. Docker has a scratch file system. If you follow the layers of Docker images all the way up, every image out there eventually goes back to scratch. And scratch is nothing. Scratch is completely empty. There is nothing in the entire file system. There is no binsh. There is no lib. There is no temp. There is nothing at all in that file system. There are no shells. Nothing to run. So if we were to base something off of that, that would pretty much eliminate all the tools that someone would use against us. So let's take that example. And this one actually takes a little bit of effort. First off, it's a multi-stage build. Um, what that means is I have multiple firm lines in here. And from one section, one later image we kicked off, we can pull files from another one. So I'm doing the build first, and then I copy that output uh, app binary to the second stage. And I also use the cgo enable equals zero. That basically made it a completely statically linked binary. No links to libc or anything else on the file system. So I've done that. I've copied the binary here with that copy command. that said copy from one stage to the other. So I pretty much have a self-building you know, self environment that builds this one little binary that's all by itself with nothing else on the file system. And if I try to run this, um, I'd move the user in there. So I took the user out of the docker run command. If I try to run this, you'll quickly see that it doesn't work. And it doesn't work because the app user that was in there only existed in that first stage. When we went to that second stage, there was no Etsy password file. There was no Etsy group file, nothing in there, so there are no users on that second environment. So to get that user in there, I have to copy Etsy password, Etsy group. I also copied a couple other things in there, certificates, time zones, just to try to get an environment that looked a little bit more like a realistic environment. Rebuilt that run it, and I failed a second time. In this case, the reason I was failing, and you can't see it quite yet, now you can, binsh was not found. So for some reason, we tried to kick this thing off, it was looking for a binsh. 
and you got about three seconds to try to get a free sticker out of me if you can guess why Venice H wasn't there. Feel free to yell on that one. Two, one, time's up. Well, Venice H isn't on the file system, but why is Docker looking for Venice H? And the reason is that CMD line. CMD with the straight regular string is gonna kick off a shell. CMD in this JSON syntax there is gonna use a Linux exec command. It's not gonna call a shell. So we're gonna kick this off without any shell at all. It's just gonna call a straight Linux exec. The reason you would wanna have that normal shell syntax normally is because you might be expanding variables, you might be doing IO redirection. There's a lot of stuff the shells give you by default. So we've done that, it's up and running, and we saw nothing in there. So it might have actually worked, but we have no idea why, or if it did. And the reason we don't know is because my code there had absolutely no error handling at all in it. So that was, you know, like a professional developer, I finally came around to that point later on. I think they have trained um, bots to write machine, machine learning bots on Go language, and they learned if error not equals nil was the entire program was just a whole bunch of those lines because that's all Go programmers are if, if you do error handling. So I finally put that in there, kick this off, and you see BinSH, no file or directory. So our remote code execution was to kick off whatever script we passed with BinSH. So now we saw we locked this down. It's no longer able to run anything because our exploit vector no longer exists inside the container at all. Not only that, but pretty much any tool ever, anywhere, from any developer, it's no longer gonna exist. I'm gonna pull up a second image I'm gonna build off of this one, which is I'm just taking my entire scratch file system that is generated with all the binaries in there, and I'm gonna throw it in another container, and I'm gonna run a little find command against that. Because so what I wanna show you is when we build this, I wanna give you an idea of what's in a file system when you're basing it off of just scratch, with just nothing. So I'm gonna build this thing, and when I run it, you're gonna see the entire file system there. The app slash app, so there's our one binary in the entire file system. That's it. We've got the couple other Etsy files we copied over. A few other things there, are the SSL, the TLS code in there, the Etsy password, the Etsy group file, so now we can run stuff as user. A whole bunch of time zones. We got way too many time zones out there, don't we? Way too many time zones. Um, yeah, that's what we need to get to, please. All right, but we don't see user bin. We don't see the bin directory, we don't see temp, we don't see home, we don't see the roots home directory. We don't see any other file on the entire file system. This is an empty file system other than the specific files we copied over. So if we can start getting applications that we can lock down, get something that's statically compiled, get something that's minimal, we can make an environment that is a real pain in the butt to attack. Promise not to curse, right? Okay, I don't think that's gonna work for everybody but for those people it does work for, this is an awesome thing. If you can't go that far, if you can't lock it down so that you, there is absolutely nothing else in the file system but your one application, at least go with the minimal file system. At least limit things so that you're not pulling in an entire JDK if all you need is a JRE. If all you need is just a minimal Alpine image, don't pull in the full CentOS with an SSH daemon running or something else in there that you didn't need to put in a container. Limit to just the stuff you need to run, and by having less stuff in there, that's a better environment to defend from, from the blue team. Not so much from the red team, but from the blue team. So no compilers, no editors. You don't need Vim inside a container. You're not editing files in there. If you need to add something, you edit, build your new image, redeploy. No need to go into a container to modify something like that, so no need to put an editor. For the developers that need it, give them a developer image. Saw earlier my little multi-stage build, the first stage they could build just that stage. You can tag and say, Docker build that first stage and not the second one. And the developers can build that, do all their stuff, have all their debuggers, all their editors, whatever they need, tweak and test and try out all their changes. And then they can build the second stage that has just the resulting binary in there. So they can lock this down if they need to. All right, and then please don't run that developer image in production. Please. All right, so hopefully you've seen that, yes, containers are bad. All those things on the first slide, that containers are bad is absolutely true. Also true, containers are good for security. We can do stuff in containers that we can't do on a virtual machine, but conversely, there is that other truth in there that I think a lot of people know, that there's a lot of stuff in virtual machine that you can't do in containers. All right, so we're able to remove these tools, we're able to have these additional layers of defense that you can't have with a regular virtual machine. We're also able to remove capabilities on a per application level. If you went onto a Linux system and you started removing the capabilities for their first, 
that could potentially block all of our other applications. If you need some capabilities to run an SSHD daemon, and you don't need to run your application, if you run your application in a container, then you can limit it so it doesn't have all those other capabilities in there. So you can lock this down a whole lot farther. So this is for the people who don't know containers. I think, you know, I saw a lot of hands down on that first part. I'm not sure if people are just tired from a long day or if they really don't know. So hopefully for those people, you've got a good idea of what's going on. Pretty much every talk out there though has to talk about all the other cool things that you can do in containers. Um, out of the box, there was an exploit that just came out what, about two weeks ago now with run C. And this is the runtime that Docker uses to kick off containers. It's also the runtime for Kubernetes. Every other Docker environment pretty much uses this by default. They kick it off through there. And the solution was either A, don't run your containers as root. So we could have solved that a minute ago. The other solution, if you do need to run stuff as root, is to use user namespaces. User namespaces in a container just says offset all the UIDs by X number. So if you're UID zero in a container, you might be UID 10,000 on the host. And so if you broke out from the container onto the host, you're now in no man's land where you can't do anything, or at least not as root. Um, so that's what user namespaces gives us. It breaks a couple things too, so that it's not turned on out of the box. Uh, stuff that it breaks is if you ever wanna work with files on the file system that users there are trying to mount into the container, all of a sudden they're having all kinds of file permission issues. But for the most part, if, if you can do this, that's a really awesome feature to turn on. Um, so definitely when you're starting to lock stuff down, harden it, go that direction. Syscalls, um, we have a shared Linux kernel, right? Every access to the Linux kernel goes to a syscall. If we can limit those syscalls, we can limit what people can do on our environment. Docker does this for us already. They've cut a whole bunch of them out. You can take more of them out. You can profile your application and decide, I don't need these 20 syscalls to run my application, so just lock them out completely. This is more of an advanced uh, tactic if you go to it, but the sec comp comes out of the box with Docker, not a third party tool at all. And you can profile your application, figure out what to turn off and turn it off in sec comp, and that's proactive. That says nobody can even run it. They try to run an, an invalid syscall, they just get an access denied and you know, operation not permitted. The flip side of that, the sysdig and valco, those are reactive. So those are things that run, they have like a little kernel plugin that works off the, um, Berkeley packet filter technology, EBP, EBPF, if I can say that three times fast. And that's gonna do some reactive stuff looking at syscalls. So if someone runs something in there, you can also get a lot more finer grain with the stuff that Sysdig does. You can say, if I see a shell being spawned off from this other process, there's something wrong there, go ahead and quarantine that container and you know, put it off to the side. So we've got this ability with syscalls and that pretty much locks stuff down from hitting that Linux kernel in a very secure way. Um, the runtimes themselves, though, we mentioned that everything in Linux is a shared kernel. We told that a dozen times so far, and that's kind of 50% true. We can change the runtime. We can swap it out. Google came out with theirs a while back, Gvisor. And Gvisor is, from the Google standpoint, a user kernel, as best I understand it. User kernel that intercepts all the requests, interprets whatever you're doing at the syscall level, and process a bunch of the more vulnerable ones at the user space without going to the kernel directly. And then once they validate everything's good, then they either pass it on to the kernel or give you the right response back. The challenge of that is they haven't implemented everything out over there. So there are some applications that don't run under Gvisor. Kata containers, um, they were pretty much the first and popular solution to making every container a virtual machine. So you have all the benefits of containers, the very small environments, very ephemeral, things that get spun up all over the place, but now you can run that in its own little minimal virtual machine for every container, it kicks it off, it goes under QEMU. And the latest one that's kind of entered that area has been Firecracker, came in from AWS. So that one is just kind of the next iteration of this whole project. Looks like an interesting one, I haven't had a chance to play with it. Image scanning is huge. Um, I see this one all over the place, every vendor out in the world seems to have an image scanning solution out there. A whole bunch of these are free. This is basically saying, let's look at what we have inside the container, make sure that what we're running is actually secure. Make sure we don't have vulnerabilities sitting inside of our images that we're pushing out there. So we can scan all of our images that we're running out there, make sure that we don't have vulnerable code, and almost invariably, whenever I've seen these scans run, they come up with about 100 or so vulnerabilities. You know, it's just vulnerabilities all over the place. If, if you have a production environment, you're with an image that's you know, so old. What this doesn't tell you is, is that vulnerability in the critical path. You might have something that's just a minor risk that's not even in the critical path at all, you don't even run that code, 
but it still gets flagged, and so it becomes information overload to a lot of clients. So I see this as they absolutely want it, they request it in the sales, and they run it the first time, this is too much for me to figure out because when I go through all these, each time I look at one of them, it's just not really a vulnerability to me. It is vulnerable, but we don't run it. We don't kick off that coding uh, graphics processing of some picture. And the risk is someone gives you a malicious picture that can go through and break that. Well, if the only time you ever call a library is on your own binaries, your own pictures on your own local machine that you trusted, then that might not be a risk to you. And it goes on and on. You go through all the vulnerabilities, same, same thing. But I still see a lot. It's a good habit to get into. That wouldn't help you with a zero day. So it's good to scan, but it doesn't help you with a zero day. Um, the next thing I see people look for is image signing. This one, it becomes a you know, certificate management nightmare for me. Because you usually don't want to have a single person in your company is signing everything.